couple of weeks ago, I went down to New Orleans for the annual Range Master Tactical Conference. This is a gathering where some of the absolute best self-defense instructors from all over the country get together to offer two and four hour long kind of mini classes on all kinds of topics. There's a lot of shooting instruction on the range, but there's also stuff like empty hand skills, emergency medical training, bladed weapon skills, uh, lectures on criminal psychology, self-defense case law, a history of firearms training. There's something for just about everybody. This was my fifth time at TACCON and it's always one of the highlights of my year. The course lineup is a little different every time, but there is one seminar that's been offered every year that I've been there and that's the one I wanna talk about today. It's the Experiential Learning Lab with Craig Douglas. Now, if you don't know who Craig Douglas is, um, you should probably do something about that. I'm not gonna try and read off his whole resume, but I would consider Craig one of the leaders in what I like to call the interdisciplinary revolution that we're seeing unfold in the firearms training world right now. In the 600 plus hours of firearms and self-defense training that I've taken, the classes I've done with Craig are easily among the most memorable and thought-provoking. I have not shared as much of what I've learned from these classes as I would have liked because well, mostly it just tends to be really dense and it's difficult to summarize in a short video. But today I'm gonna to try and fix that. The brief description of the Experiential Learning Lab would be that it's a force-on-force -force scenario exercise, but that doesn't really do it justice because to some people that would mean that uh, it's just a bunch of grown men in 5'11 pants playing a game of paintball with blue clocks. And that's not really what Craig is about. It's more about decision-making than about shooting. He starts by picking volunteers. There were 14 in this case to go through a simple blind scenario that represents a scene out of typical everyday life. The rest of us had to just silently watch from the sidelines. There are trained role players in the scenario with very specific instructions on what to do and how to respond based on the participants' actions. Now, unfortunately, I can't describe for you the actual scenario that was used this time because, well, Craig might want to reuse that scenario again someday and that would spoil it for everyone else. In the past, it's been things kind of along the lines of like you're coming out of Walmart with your buddy and you guys have to walk to your car over there or you're going to the ATM to get some cash. So go stand in line behind those other people. And then something disruptive happens, like maybe the person gets approached by an aggressive panhandler or there might be a, a couple nearby that gets into a nasty shouting match. And then the participant has to decide how they're gonna respond to that. Each volunteer is given a protective mask and a paint pellet firing simunition gun to carry, but the situation may or may not require actually using that gun. There's not necessarily a right or wrong way to respond, and there are usually multiple ways to resolve the scenario with a more or less positive outcome. After each volunteer completes the scenario, Craig does a debrief and asks questions to help walk them through why they responded the way they did. Without giving too much away about the specific scenario, I wanna share a couple of observations after watching 14 people respond in totally different ways to the same circumstances. For the people who ended up with a less than desirable outcome, it seemed like the thing that was most likely to get them into trouble was indecisiveness. In a couple of cases, it was the classic freeze response. You can see that a lot in surveillance camera footage of violent encounters. Uh, it might be something like two guys shooting at each other in a gas station parking lot, and there's one person just standing in the middle like they don't know how to process what's going on. There's, there's gunfire going on around them, and they just freeze. Uh, so there were a couple of moments kind of like that, but what I saw more of was the kind of half-hearted effort at taking action, the true indecisiveness. Like, I kind of want to do A, but I might be better off if I do B. And then when they actually do get around to doing something, they're still not totally committed, and that can go south really quick. Decision-making under pressure is a complex topic, and I don't think it's possible to simply will yourself to be better at it, but more often than not, committing to some course of action, even if it's not the ideal one, is better than no decision. And I can give you a personal example of this. I was going through a scenario myself last year in a class that I took from Craig. I got to a point in the scenario where I was holding a threat at gunpoint and I needed to give him some very specific verbal commands, which is something we had practiced earlier in the day. But I couldn't remember exactly what I was supposed to say. And instead of just kind of winging it, I froze for literally 10 or 15 seconds and didn't say a thing 
while I was trying to remember the right words. And at that point, almost anything I could have said would have been better than saying nothing because my silence was sending the message to that threat that I was not confident in what I was doing. So action beats inaction most of the time. That's not a bad rule of thumb to fall back on if you don't have anything else going for you. One of my favorite responses to the TACCON scenario was a woman who very decisively avoided being involved in the situation altogether. Now that doesn't always work out, but I think it's important to point out that taking decisive action doesn't always mean heroic action. Sometimes it's just about survival. Another thing that messed people up at the TACCON scenario was uh, kind of at the opposite end of the spectrum, and that's a lack of flexibility. And what I mean in this case is that people had made a decision in advance, either consciously or subconsciously, about how they would respond to certain circumstances. Now, that's not a bad thing in itself, but when the situation in front of them was saying that maybe their plan was a really bad idea, they still ran with it anyway. Now, again, I don't want to give away the scenario, so let me give you some parallel hypotheticals. Maybe I've decided that if I ever find anyone in my house who doesn't belong there, I'm going to shoot him. Now, does that plan leave any room for positive threat identification? What if it's my neighbor who has Alzheimer's? Or what if my wife let in the cable guy without telling me? Or what if I have a teenage kid and it's one of their friends playing a prank? Having a plan is good, but we have to be able to adapt to the circumstances and accept that however we envision a deadly force encounter happening is almost definitely not how it's going to actually go down. So like if some dude catches me off guard at the gas station and starts waving a knife in my face, maybe my best option is not to go for my gun, but hand in my keys. Because no matter how fast I can draw, I'm still probably going to get stabbed in the face. But if I comply, and instead of driving away in my car, he tells me to get in the trunk, well, at that point, my odds of survival probably go way up if I fight back. If my only planned response to a deadly threat is to shoot them before they can get me, I might be leaving a lot of options on the table that would actually increase my chances of survival. So just because I have a gun doesn't mean that's the first answer to every problem I might run into. Even if it is a deadly threat problem, I might have to be flexible and wait for my moment before I get to practice my one second draw stroke, or there it might be a better resolution altogether, like avoiding the situation or compliance or running away or verbal de-escalation or non-lethal force. All these options won't always be available, but sometimes the gun option won't be available either. Now, I don't say any of this to be critical of the people who volunteered for the scenario at TACCON. All of this analysis is with the benefit of hindsight, and that's why it's called the Experiential Learning Lab. As far as I could tell, every participant there had a really open mind, and I want to acknowledge that it takes a lot of guts to volunteer to do one of these things in front of a bunch of spectators. If you ever have the chance to take a class with Craig or to do any other kind of scenario-based training with a qualified instructor, I highly recommend jumping on that. I guarantee you will learn something useful.